Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I am uh, I am Yuki Shiraido, Assistant Professor of Political Science, and I am the moderator today. Um, welcome to our third uh, CJS lecture for Winter 2024. Um, and before introducing the speaker today, uh, let, me, uh, let me give general announcements from the Center for Japanese Studies. Um, first, uh, please join us tonight at 7.15 p.m. for the next entry in CJS Winter 2024 film series, a screening of the 2017 Japanese horror comedy film one Cut of the Dead, uh, directed by Shinichiro Ueda. This screening will take place at the Michigan Theater on Liberty Street. Uh, sadly, the noon lecture originally scheduled to take place next week on March 28th, The Politics of Taxation and Redistributive uh, Equality by Professor Junko Kato, had to be cancelled due to the speaker's health concerns. Uh, Professor Kato aims to come as a speaker in next academic year's Thursday noon lecture series. Um, but uh, we, will, we still will have a noon lecture next week uh, on March 28th. Uh, please join us for uh, can you hear the difference between a tactical aircraft and a commercial airplane? Uh, views from Okinawa and transnational approaches by uh, interdisciplinary artist and educator Ms. Aya Rodriguez uh, Izumi. Uh, for those attendees joining the webinar on Zoom, webcams and microphones have been muted. But we invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions you have. And the presenters will try to address as many as possible. The live transcription uh, will be enabled, but if you'd rather not have it, uh, it just go to the bottom right corner and disable it. Uh, please check out our CJS events page or various social media for CJS events in winter 2024. Okay, well, that's it uh, for the, the general announcement. And uh, let me introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Naoko Matsumura. Uh, professor Matsumura is uh, the professor uh, in the Graduate School of Law at Kobe University. Uh, she received a PhD from Rice University in Political Science in 2015. Um, her research interests uh, mainly, focus, uh, mainly focuses on international rela relations, and in particular international organizations, international cooperation, and uh, legalized dispute settlements, and so on and so forth. Uh, she published uh, several papers uh, in, um, in, in journals uh, like Journal of East Asian Studies, Journal of Peace Research, British Journal of Political, uh, Politics and International Relations. With that, um, I will let the speaker speak, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. to be here today. So I'd like to uh, extend my deepest gratitude to Professor Schleiter and also the Center for Japanese Study for giving me this incredible opportunity. So as M Professor Schleiter introduced um, um, almost nine years ago, I completed my PhD at Rice University in Houston, Texas. And during my PhD study, um, unfortunately, I couldn't have a chance to visit Michigan. So I'm really thrilled to um, visit here today. Um, and also, this is first visit for me to um, visit United States after uh, COVID-19. So I'm really excited to come th to the US. So today, I'm going to uh, talk about our studies on nuclear taboo in Japan. 
So this is something I've been working on over the past three years with my co-authors, Professor Joseph Grieco at Duke University and Professor Atsushitago at Waseda University in Tokyo. So we've conducted several survey and experiments on this issue, and I will be sharing uh, findings from three key survey we've conducted um, so far. And This is the overview. So overview present what we've done in three surveys. So the first survey investigate how external security and environment in East Asia shape Japanese public opinion on the Japan's acquisition of nuclear weapons. So we conducted the survey as, uh, in uh, 2019 and 2020 with nationally representative sample. And the second survey uh, focused more on the local perspectives in Hiroshima, one of the target city of nuclear attack in 1945. And we explored the status of nuclear taboo among people in Hiroshima. And our most recent and third experiment focused more on um, Japanese view on potential nuclear shelling arrangement with the United States. Have you ever heard of the nuclear shelling agreement? Someone, no. So the idea of nuclear shelling is that non-nuclear state like Japan um, deploy the nuclear warhead of the United States into the, uh, their territory and operate them jointly. So during the peacetime, for example, Japan store the U.S. nuclear warhead and the in, the in the wartime carry them on a Japanese kind of self-defense fighter jet. So, um, as I will explain later in more detail, uh, the discussion over the nuclear shelling with the United States and Japan was suddenly kind of initiated by former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on 2022. So in the Sabe, we looked at the role of the public figure may play in facilitating public support for nuclear option. So through these surveys, what we wanted to explore was how strong or breakable nuclear taboo is in Japan. And if that is not the case, what factor could break the taboo? So now, uh, let me explain what do we mean by nuclear taboo. So the original concept of nuclear taboo refers to the ethical norm against using nuclear weapon proposed by scholar Nina Tannenwald in her book and articles. And in her book, she argued that since the ethical norm against using nuclear weapon is very strong, no one think of or afraid of breaking it. This is why nuclear weapon has not been used for a long time since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in our study, we interpret this concept more broadly and understand it as the ethical norm against possessing or developing nuclear weapon, and also some kind of allergic reaction toward discussing such matter. Because for a long time, Japanese people have been believed to have strong normative taboo in this sense as the only country who have experienced atomic bombing in warfare. And this sentiment was solidified by traditional three non-nuclear principle announced by Prime Minister Isaac Sato in 1976, which prohibit uh, production, possession, and introduction of nuclear weapon to Japanese territory. And these principles were never made into law. Therefore, they are not legally binding principle, but they are still viewed as a cornerstone of Japanese official nuclear policy to this day. In academia, there is a strong consensus that Japan has peaceful cultural norm, which significantly limit Japanese aggressive security policy, as noted by seminar scholars like Thomas Bargo or Peter Kattenstein. However, recent years, there seems a potential change in this long-term taboo. So please look at this table. This table summarized opinion poll results conducted by Genlon, which is famous think tank in Japan. So since 2016, this poll asked respondents whether they think Japan should have nuclear weapon along with other policy options. And as we can see, the majority of respondents still oppose nuclear armament. However, there has been modest increase in support year by year. And also, there is a notable increase in do not know responses, which is 
of 14.5 percent in 2016, but which increases to 26.1 percent in 2023. So their expressed opposition toward nuclear armament may be declining. So these findings made us wonder if Japanese nuclear taboo is still firm and it has been assumed for a long time. Surprisingly, this question has not systematically analyzed by scholars, especially in Japan. Therefore, uh, to find answer to this question, we conducted our first survey experiment in 2019. So for those who are unfamiliar with the survey experiment, so the survey experiment is a unique survey method in which participants were randomly assigned a different kind of information or scenario and then asked to the same question. So if their answer vary depending on the information they are received, we can conclude that information had a causal impact on their answers. So in this experiment, we looked at the impact of deteriorating security environment for Japan as a factor that might weaken the taboo among Japanese. And especially, we focused three aspects of security environment. So the first aspect is the nuclear threat from North Korea. Since the current leader, Kim Jong-un, took power in 2011, North Korea launched frequently the missiles. So the last year, North Korea launched 18 times, which is the second highest level. And this year, it already launched twice. And the most recent one occurred three days ago. And so whenever North Korea launched missile, security message uh, appeared on TV. So this picture I took three days ago at home. And additionally, when missiles it deemed to capable enough to uh, reach Japanese territory, security alert is appear on TV. So this one also I took at home. So it said information of national protection and said evacuate immediately, evacuate immediately because North Korea launched missiles. So it's dangerous. So when I saw this uh, message, it's kind of frightening. So this suggests maybe only Japanese get easier to feel security threat from North Korea. Therefore, we expected this elevated um, perception of security threat from North Korea may prompt Japanese to support for uh, nuclear armament and think it most necessary and justifiable. And the second aspect of the security uh, uh, dimension is the reliability of alliance commitment by the United States because the nuclear umbrella provided by the U.S. has been a key factor dissuading Japanese government from pursu um, pursuing its nuclear arsenal. So we speculated that um, if this U.S. defense commitment may not seem reliable, as hinted by former President Trump, could prompt Japanese to contemplate independent um, nuclear capability. And the third factor is about South Korean situation, nuclear status. Um, although South Korea has not pursued its nuclear weapon, but its acquisition of such capability could psychologically affect Japanese fabric. So the prospect of South Korean attaining great power status through nuclear armament might delight some Japanese to support nuclear acquisition to maintain its Japanese standing or maintain regional polity. So the combination of these three aspects propose different level of security deterioration for Japan. For instance, the current situation or a situation when we conducted the survey in 2019 is the first law in which uh, South Korea, uh, sorry, North Korea has stopped its nuclear test and also Japan enjoyed a strong security ties with the United States. And there's no sign that South Korea is developing nuclear option. So using this combination as our experimental manipulation, in, we implemented SABE experiment. So this is the scenario we used that uh, respondent actually read. So participants were presented with hypothetical scenario in form of mock news editorial. So following the brief title, it introduces three security dimensions, as I mentioned before, as bird point. 
So highlighted uh, phrasing colors are manipulation within a scenario. So green indicate status quo, so which is good news for Japan, favorable security uh, condition. While uh, red phrases indicate degradation from status quo, which is bad news for Japan. For example, participant in the worst case treatment were assigned to all these um, red phrases, whereas participant in the status quo treatment will assign to all green phases. And rest of the participant, uh, so the mixture of green and red um, sentences. So if the nuclear taboo is strong enough to constrain the respondent, we should observe the uniform level of support for acquiring nuclear acquisition regardless of the scenario they are assigned to. However, if this is not the case, it could serve kind of evidence that nuclear taboo might be weakened under certain security condition, especially when people perceive a worsening security uh, situation for Japan. And after presenting one of these scenario, we ask respondent, would you approve or disapprove of Japan acquiring nuclear weapon using six point scale from strongly approve and strongly disapprove? And we implemented this survey in August 2019, including the dates of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki so that we expected um, people's nuclear taboo might be um, prompted. So this is the design. So what is the result? So here is the result. So this figure presents the percentage of Japanese who approve of acquiring nuclear weapon. Uh, just please ignore this perceivable. Just pay attention to these bars. So um, first thing we notice is that people's support for Japan's acquiring nuclear weapon never exceed 28 uh, 0.4%. So Japanese do exhibit some kind of aversion toward nuclear weapon, uh, yet we can still observe the effect of treatment. So for example, support for nuclear weapon increases during, <coughs> sorry, under worse security condition compared to status quo situation. So those who are informed of status quo situation 21 point of them support for nuclear acquisition, while those who are informed of the worst case scenario, around 28% of them support. So this seven percentage point difference is statistically significant, and it suggests the worsening security environment may break taboo among Japanese. Nevertheless, um, as you can see, these bars are largely overlap over five treatments. So initially, we expected Japanese support for the nuclear armament would be the highest in the worst case scenario, but we didn't find um, dishonorable differences across these other security situations. Therefore, um, it is possible that degradation in any one of security dimension in uh, three dimension is sufficient to weaken the taboo among Japanese. This is main findings. But in this survey, we ask additional question, which is about public attitude toward US deployment of nuclear weapon. So we ask respondent if they approve or disapprove the United States deploying nuclear weapon to Guam to defend Japan from North Korean threat. So blue bar in this figure show the respondent support for the US deployment of nuclear weapon um, in Guam, while the gray bar indicates support for Japan's acquisition of nuclear weapon. Notably, blue bar always higher than this uh, gray bar. So we think this disparity as an evidence of some kind of nuclear double standard among Japanese population. Because if nuclear taboo were robust, Respondent would oppose the use of nuclear weapon by any country. However, the data reveal that Japanese aversion to nuclear weapon is relatively weaker when it comes to US deployment of nuclear weapon for Japan's protection. So Japanese aversion to nuclear weapon may be not rooted in kind of pure ethical norm, but could be affected by kind of utilitarian collaboration. 
So this is a first experiment. However, one shot or single experiment cannot tell as comprehensive insight. So to verify the robustness of a finding, we conducted or replicate the same survey in the following year of 2020. And here is the outcome. As you can see, uh, this time we reduced the number of treatment because we wanted to increase sample size to gain statistical power to make conclusive uh, result. Uh, but, and we tested theoretically important treatment, which were the status quo treatment and worst case treatment. But still, as in uh, 2019 survey, um, we still find elasticity of nuclear taboo in Japan. So the worst case scenario significantly increased the level of support for Japan's deployment of nuclear weapon compared to this uh, baseline group or status quo group. And also about um, US deployment of nuclear weapon, we found the same similar result. Uh, so Japanese are more supportive for US deployment of nuclear weapon to defend Japan as in uh, 19, uh, 2019 survey. Okay, now let me briefly uh, show you about how public opinion vary by respondent individual characteristics. And then the most notable difference uh, reaction is from gender. So this figure ship separate responses by gender and plot the percentage of support for acquisition. It appears that male are consistently more supportive for nuclear acquisition than female. So this kind of tendency of kind of hawkishness among men is often reported in a survey of this kind. But the crucial point is here is about female uh, respondent. So in our survey, even female respondent changed their opinion in favor of nuclear acquisition when they presented with a uh, worst case scenario or treatment. And this figure also show the variation in responses based on the respondent support for Liberal Democratic Party, which is the governing party of Japan. It's evident that supporters for the Liberal Democratic Party are more inclined toward nuclear armament because LDP is kind of somewhat a conservative party which seeks for revising constitution and seeking a national army thing. So the key insight from these two years survey is that potential erosion of Japanese nuclear taboo due to deteriorating security condition. Let me proceed to the second study now. So in our effort to further investigate this elasticity of Japanese nuclear taboo, we conducted more targeted survey in Hiroshima city last year because we thought people in Hiroshima or Hiroshima would be the hardest case to find the erosion of nuclear taboo because of its history. And if we discover any sign of erosion in Hiroshima, there would be particularly telling. So this time we targeted people living closer to the epicenter of nuclear bombing in 1945. So specifically we chose three districts um, in Hiroshima city. Here is um, this atomic bomb dome and we chose um, district, three districts closer to this epicenter circled by this red, um, yellow uh, circle. So we expected people living uh, there would have deeply ingrained escrow against nuclear weapon, not only because they, um, what happened there, they leave, uh, but also uh, because they often see kind of peace activity by university students or visitor to this um, atomic bomb. So they might um, kind of more internalize ethical aversion against nuclear weapon. So to approach people living in this area, um, we sent direct mail to approximately 1,000 households in three districts. So in our mailing envelope, we enclosed a letter that explained we are going to ask questions about nuclear weapon along other questions including uh, Hiroshima GA summit. 
And also, we enclose a QR code through which participants uh, answer our question. And we carried out uh, the survey during a G7 summit meeting in Hiroshima in May last year. Because the, the, the issue of nuclear weapon is one of the key themes in the summit in context of Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this is not experiment. This is simple survey, including questionnaire. Okay. So let me show you the result. The first, we need to admit that response rate is very low. So we received only around 100 responses or fewer, depending on the district, which is about 30% of what we sent out. And it's kind of happened in mail uh, survey. And especially this time, we didn't pay anything for the participation. So the respondents are very voluntarily uh, participant for this uh, survey. So we can say some of those people may be biased or really have something to say, but we can still have, uh, derive some insights. So approximately 25 to 29 percent of participants were in favor of Japan's acquiring nuclear weapon, and this number is nearly identical to what we found in experiment in 2019 and 2022, uh, sorry, 2020, with nationally representative sample. Therefore, even people of Hiroshima do not necessarily hold a stronger type of sentiment against nuclear weapon compared to the rest of Japanese. And the percentage of support was slightly higher for another question, especially for the US deployment of nuclear weapon in Japan to deter China than for Japan's own nuclear acquisition. But the difference between these two figures are not discernible. Regarding the discussion of nuclear arrangement with a sharing arrangement with the United States, their support is high, which is quite surprising to us because we expected people in Hiroshima would not like to discuss or start discussion of nuclear sharing because they may lead to actual policy of nuclear sharing. So this finding is very surprising. Okay. So let's move on to our most recent study, uh, which is about public opinion on Japan's nuclear shelling with the United States. So as I mentioned earlier, the idea of nuclear shelling is that Japan deploy nuclear weapon of the United States within Japan's territory and operate them jointly. And nuclear shelling has been practiced uh, in some NATO countries like Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Turkey. But for Japan, what is crucial is blinging nuclear warhead onto the Japanese soil, which is very different from NATO country like Germany, where nuclear warhead are already stationed during the Cold War. Whereas in Japan, the nuclear warhead deployed in Okinawa during the Cold War were removed when Okinawa returned to Japan in 1970s. So that's very different and also nuclear shelling constitute a clear violation of three known nuclear principles. But this topic of nuclear shelling suddenly appeared in February 2022 when former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe brought up this topic during the TV show. So in that TV show, Mr. Abe said that Japan should consider nuclear shelling with the United States. While he had been considered a known as conservative partition who seeks for revising constitution, having a kind of military in Japan. So, he, but his remark was quite surprising because it's quite rare uh, in Japan that public figure openly support discussing a nuclear weapon. So motivated by this episode, we decided to examine whether clear endorsement or opposition for, from public figure would affect public opinion toward nuclear option. And the literature of political communication has demonstrated that citizens often rely on the stance of public figures when forming their opinion on complex policy issues such as foreign policy or national security issues because we as normal 
people really don't have knowledge on this issue. So since policymakers have policy relevant information and expertise on this issue, there are, so their supportive of opinion or opposition act as kind of policy cue or information shortcut for the public. So based on this argument, our experiment used um, support or opposition from four actors as our treatment. So first, the partitions from leading party, LDP, a second, partition from both leading party and opposition party. And third actor is military personnel, so former top ranking officer of Japan's self-defense forces. And finally, uh, citizens. So politicians and military personnel are considered political experts, policy experts. But in addition, we included the opinion of citizens because recent research suggests people also rely on what other fellow citizens say when form their opinion on foreign policy, so we included it. So we hypothesized that public support for nuclear shelling might be higher if public figure as well as fellow citizens endorse that policy, while it would be lower if public figures or as well as fellow citizens oppose the policy. And to test this hypothesis, we again conducted experiment. Here is the vignette we provided for the respondent as a mock newspaper article. So article begins with fact-based information that recent security environment for Japan has worsened due to um, threats from North Korea and China in the first paragraph. And it then, in the second paragraph, explain there have been an idea of Japan nuclear shelling with the United States, and also we explain the nuclear shelling has been practiced in some country, and also South Korea has also started to consider this option. And in the second paragraph, we clearly mention nuclear shelling uh, arrangement involved the deployment or introducing nuclear weapon into Japan. And at the end, it describes which actor support or oppose the idea of nuclear shelling. So this highlighted part is the manipulation. So respondent in the control group did not read this last sentence. Okay. So after presenting one of these scenario, we asked respondent if they approve or disapprove Japan's engagement in nuclear shelling with the United States. So this is the result. So each bar shows the percentage of Japanese who favor seeking a nuclear shelling with the United States. So supportive Q endorsement appear to have positive impact on approval regardless of who expresses support. So the average percentage of approval among those who receive endorsement is 49%, close to 50%, and it's almost um, 20 percentage point higher than that in the control group. So this suggests policy endorsement may encourage Japanese support for nuclear shelling. But as you notice, what is mysterious here is about uh, the opposition from self defense forces and public uh, opinion, which are actually uh, positive and statistically significant difference from the control group, which contradict our expectation because initially we expected wh when um, self defense forces say no to the nu nuclear uh, shelling, Japanese support would be uh, lower than um, without that condition. So this is something we need to come up with explanation. But overall, we found some kind of political cue might work. And we also found the impact of endorsement differs by respondent player knowledge uh, of nuclear shelling discussion. So here we can see the impact of endorsement is zero for those who have heard of nuclear shelling discussion before taking this survey, so we didn't, didn't see any kind of statistical difference across the green bar. So bar also 95 confidence interval largely overlap, so there's no differences. But conversely, the impact of endorsement is significant. Those who were not familiar uh, with the nuclear shelling discussion at the time of taking this survey.
So for this difference, uh, there are two potential reasons. The first is that the possibility that those who have already heard about the topic of nuclear shelling before taking the SABE should have known who already supported or opposed this policy. Therefore, policy queue information did not provide any really new information for those people. Uh, that's one possibility. Because when Mr. Abe started this topic, many newspaper company or TV kind of featured this news. So most Japanese got heard of this um, uh, policy issue. And the second possibility is that those who are familiar with topics tend to have higher political interest or knowledge or national security issue. Therefore, they can form their opinion without relying on what other people say. So they may, so there's two points might be difference between this green bar and red bars. So our third experiment suggests two things in terms of Japanese nuclear taboo. The first, it seems that the majority of Japanese is open to the idea of introducing nuclear weapon into Japanese territory. This is quite surprising because it's clearly challenged the traditional three known nuclear principle. And the second, Japanese public toward nuclear weapon may shift by simple information that someone supports such policy, so which carries um, significant policy implication. Okay. So let me summarize my talk. So I think our study can provide some tentative conclusion on the nuclear taboo in Japan. First, nuclear taboo among Japanese may not be so firm or robust as previously assumed. So in certain security scenarios, circumstances, or when public figure express support, Japanese people appear more inclined to endorse the acquisition of nuclear weapon. Moreover, a segment of the Japanese population seems to support the idea of bringing nuclear weapon into Japanese soil. So this suggests, again, the constraining power of the traditional three non-nuclear principle is uh, getting weaker. And secondly, the experiment have uncovered a double standard um, within a nuclear taboo. So there is a higher level of support among Japanese for the U.S. using nuclear weapon to defend Japan than for Japan itself developing nuclear weapon. So this attitude could be interpreted as if there is a way to defend Japan without dirtying our hands, it's something acceptable, which is really not ethically driven constellation. So some of you might think uh, what I talked today, uh, nothing surprising because uh, public perception of risk are subject to change. Yet that, yes, that would be true. But uh, what we think, what I think important is to provide evidence or to examine what have been assumed for a long time uh, without any doubt in society is actually valid empirically. And unlike the U.S., uh, public opinion polls is really limited and infrequent in Japan. So neither uh, national government or, uh, nor newspaper company systematically conduct uh, nuclear, um, public opinion poll on this nuclear issue, which I think is uh, problematic. So the issue of nuclear weapon is, of course, very sensitive, but that's not sufficient reason to avoid studying how public change uh, their view over uh, nuclear weapon. So we must recognize the hurdles to acquire nuclear weapon in Japan may be diminishing. Uh, indeed, regarding conventional weapon capability, in our other SABE, it appears that Japanese people are very supportive for government shift toward increased military spending and position of counter strike capability, which allow uh, for retaliation against offensive attack for defensive purpose, of course. But it's, uh, things changing. And finally, um, our SABE, of course, has a lot of shortcomings and some findings really hard to interpret and not clear. And also, what mainly investigate here was the factor that may weaken the taboo. And we really did not fully explore what factor actually may strengthen the taboo sentiment. So if the nuclear taboo in Japan is elastic, there may be the way through which we can reinforce uh, taboo sentiment. 
So in our future research, we hope to, if we have a budget to do, uh, to investigate various other factors that include sh uh, some political and economic cost of nuclear armament or its risk for environment or health, and also negative international reaction or how American people react when Japan seeking nuclear option. And lastly, this year marks U.S. presidential election. It's highly likely that election will be contested between President uh, Biden and former President Trump. And if Mr. Trump returns to the presidency and reduces his commitment to uh, Ryan's commitment to Japan, this might facilitate nuclear shelling discussion from Japanese side to secure U.S. Uh, defense commitment to Japan. So we would like to keep an eye on this topic, and I really would like to hear what you think about potential U.S.-Japan nuclear shelling. So I will stop uh, my talk, and thank you for listening, and I'm happy to your feedback. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you very much for a fascinating talk, and uh, I will moderate uh, Q and A. If you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand or uh, um, submit your question into Q and A at Zoom. Uh, but before, uh, can I just can I just uh, uh, be a dictator just for a minute, <laughs> maybe? Um, so let me ask uh, kind of. Probably two questions um, um, about the, uh, about your research. So, for the first study, you found like a differential responses to the deployment to Guam and, and acquiring nuclear weapons uh, among the among the public, and which is kind of surprising to me because many I think many international relations scholars would think that just ordinary voters don't know anything about security policies and don't know anything about implications of deploying nuclear weapons to Guam and well the different implications between deployment to Guam and deployment to Japan or acquiring nuclear weapons and does this suggest that like a Japanese people know like more <laughs> about security policies than we would expect them to know? Or is it something <laughs> different? Uh, that's my first question. And a second question, I think the, the second question is, I think you, know, you, you probably uh, do not have data to answer that based on the evidence, but I wonder sort of this nuclear taboo is eroding or um, you know, the academic consensus about, the, uh, about nuclear taboo was just wrong. And so, you know, do you think um, the taboo was strong and it's eroding now, or it just hasn't been as robust as we thought? So those, two, those are my questions. Oh, okay. Thank you very much for really <laughs> giving me a really um, good question, actually challenging question. So the first point is about, actually really about kind of external validity thing. Right? Um, we admit um, maybe not a lot of people actually do not know what actually go what's actually going on in nuclear defense policy. So this the scenario is really kind of hypothetical news article, but once I think U.S. really deployed nuclear weapon to Guam in defense of Japan from South Korea or China threat, I think media feature that kind of news so that ordinary Japanese can see what's going on. So that was our expectation, but it hasn't happened. So it's our scenario for the first experiment is purely experimental thing. So there's not a lot of external validity is okay for my, uh, the first response. And the second one is academic consensus um, on nuclear taboo. First of all, it's really hard to observe what is nuclear taboo. So what we did here is um, kind of testing implication if there are nuclear taboos. 
So we didn't really test it, uh, the existence of nuclear taboo. So the, our assumption is nuclear taboo is already there. And if there is a taboo, what caused the degradation of nuclear taboo? So actually, I have no answer. There is really taboo sentiment among Japanese. So actually, it's really hard. The first of all, I think even scholar in the US, there's not a lot of consensus of what is taboo. So how we can capture really taboo. So it's a really interesting question and something we need to work on the definition of taboo and how empirically test existence of taboo. Great. Thank you very much. I think there is a question from the floor. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, I learned a lot today. Uh, I want to ask, um, you kind of touched on this a little bit uh, previously, and this might be sort of out of the scope of your research design, but I want to ask if age at all had a bearing on any of the results that you had, or if you kind of noticed any differences between the three surveys, like in terms of responses on age lines. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. That's a good question, because we expected um, age matters, because uh, older generation has Korea memory of World War II, but compared to younger generation. So I think I prepared some slide here. So this is kind of a logistic regression analysis. The outcome is the approval of nuclear weapon support. And so the gender, interestingly, younger people less likely to support having nuclear weapon compared to older generation. So which actually contradict our um, expectation. So younger people is more kind of dovish, uh, but younger generation. But actually, the result is not robust. So for our 2020 experiment, we didn't find the same result. So age, gener age or generation component is really unclear what kind of effect actually the generation has. But for 19. Uh, a 2019 experiment, this is kind of age component. OK, uh, second from the floor. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question about the slide you were on just before this F2, figure two. Um, the first one? First. Yeah, the first one. <laughs> Uh, next one, sorry. This one. This one, yeah. Um, I found this really interesting because I was thinking about how much of these results can be attributed to Japan's relationship with the U.S. and how much it could be attributed to views about nuclear sharing. If the prompt was nuclear sharing but from an unnamed foreign country, do you think the results would have been different? And if so, how? So... Uh, could you repeat the final part? So if yeah. Trump... Um, so if the prompt, if the question was about nuclear sharing, not from the US, but from an unnamed foreign country, do you think the results would have been different? And if so, how? Yes, I think it would be different. Because um, first, um, the purpose of doing nuclear sharing is actually reassure the US security commitment so that it should be alliance country and which Japan has strong ties already. Well, unless we cannot believe those countries will really protect us when it's necessary. So I think uh, we currently we cannot imagine nuclear sharing with other um, non-US state. So result might be different, maybe lower the bar than here. And also, if, um, I don't know, maybe it's depend the, the highest high of the bar uh, may be depending on the alliance reliability. So if it's reliable, maybe the bar is higher or higher. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Works. Thanks. Uh, Jane. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. Um, so this uh, topic is more uh, salient in South Korea recent uh, period. So I have a few related questions also relate to the age question as well. So um, 
Um, first, I think um, in South Korea, the support for nuclear um, sharing or nuclear position is higher for older generation as well because their war memories are closer to reality mm -hmm. than younger generations. So I was wondering from your age effect, taboo must be stronger, but also war memories must be stronger for your older generations. Um, so that's one question, whether there is possibility of similarity between two countries. And second question is, for the younger generation, you foc in the paper you focus on the, um, the bombing as a source of taboo, but is there a possibility that Fukushima um, nuclear accident as a more bigger taboo for younger generation from more recent experience? Um, so that was my two short question. Thank you. Uh, that's really a uh, good point. Unfortunately, we didn't test uh, how Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster affect the Japanese public opinion on nuclear weapon. So this is something, a future topic, which we would like to um, explain. And, and all um, about your first point, war memory thing, I think that is reasonable um, hypothesis. But in um, Japan case, because we invaded South Korea and other Asian country. So we, I think um, older generation, war memory kind of works in opposite direction than for Korean people because militarization or that kind of thing is really um, much stronger memory for us. So, but I think it's a good point to kind of finding out similarity or differences between South Korea and Japan. Thank you so much for your insightful comments. I think there is another question from the floor. So thank you for your thank you for your talk. Um, so I was wondering too, because you looked at South Korea and North Korea and the U.S., but uh, did you factor in or consider like? the increasing aggression of China, especially in the like vicinity of like the Senkaku Islands and what have you. Thank you. Yeah. That is really crucial point or kind of criticism for our design. Whenever I present this slide, people wonder why we didn't use China as a threat. Because Japanese people must aware the China threat than the North Korean threat. So I think result might change or much stronger reaction we could have if we uh, use China kind of aggressive behavior um, toward Japan. But at the time, North Korean threat is kind of also the clear issue. But currently, I think China is a much more bigger threat for Japan. So next experiment, if I have a budget, we want to um, kind of add some other uh, treatment about China. Thank you very much Thank for your you. comments. I think there is another from the floor. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I have a question about the trade-off argument. Uh, on one hand, you said that the opposition to having nuclear weapons is an ethical position. So one question I have is, are there you know, opinion surveys that ask people about ethical values as a reason for their opposition to Japan having nuclear weapons? So I guess there is some empirical evidence of that as an ethical position. There may be, or there may not be, and it could be ethical regardless, and it might not be. But um, my other question about the trade-off argument is it seems that the other part of that, the nuclear sharing side of that, was sort of presented as not necessarily an ethical position or uh, ethical position in contradiction to the first. But I'm wondering, in terms of the nuclear sharing, aren't there implied norms, masculinized security norms about safety and security on that side? So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering about how you're constructing that trade-off um, concept <laughs> in, in, you know, with these two things in consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first point you raised about ethical um, the question, actually in, in our survey we didn't ask about why people um, answer in this way. 
especially we didn't ask uh, what do you think about ethically wrong or correct to support nuclear weapon. We should have done that. And also there's not study that asked ethical kind of question in the survey. So there should be someone to do that. And the trade-off, um, so in this, the, especially third one, uh, we didn't um, kind of investigate a trade-off because our assumption is support for nuclear shelling is the evidence for uh, erosion of nuclear taboo, especially erosion of normative or ethical uh, constellation of um, uh, nuclear weapon, uh, anti-nuclear uh, weapon thing. So, but it's it's true. There should have both sides. The, no, but the taboo argument really focusing on normative um, thing. So that's why um, we kind of structure the argument by kind of how much um, taboo things erode by uh, <laughs> nuclear shelling things. So uh, we should kind of uh, engage more about trade-off aspect. Thank you so much. All right, another from the floor. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I learned a lot. Um, I have a question about the last endorsement experiment. Um, would you please show us the figure? <laughs> This one? Or this one? I think it's the main. Um, yes. I was wondering, I think this is very interesting because uh, my interpretation of this is that regardless of whatever um, the, the direction okay. of their preference, there is an increase um, in terms of public support. Um, I was wondering if you could use this to show that the public, um, the, the nuclear taboo actually existed. Because as long as a public figure voice their opinion on this issue, regardless of the direction, people will, may feel more free to express their own opinion on this issue. Because it's, it's sort of like if this is a sensitive topic that people are hesitant to express their honest opinion. If I see a public uh, figure is actually publicly commenting on this, mm -hmm. I feel more liberated to uh. talk about uh, or share my opinion more freely. I see. Yeah. So, so for you, this kind of uh, blue bar is not so kind of um, unintuitive findings. Right? I, I, I wonder if, if but I think it's really makes sense. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah it make, makes sense. I mean, liberating speech um, kind of environment facilitate Japanese public to express their own view. Yeah, because I, I think um, like like endorsement experiment is sometimes useful to elicit people's honest opinion on mm -hmm. sensitive attitudes. Um, so I think regardless of the direction of the public figure's um, opinion, it probably you know frees people from voice their honest oh, opinion. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, thank you for that uh, comment. So in that, in other words, maybe supportive cue really doesn't matter. So what matter is environment which facilitates discussion. Okay, let's okay. go point. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, one question from Zoom audience uh, is related to that point. So the question goes, uh, in the experiments, was there any change in the don't know responses? The time series survey by Genron shows that don't know responses increased uh, over time a lot. Um, and given that the nuclear issue is sensitive, people might have felt supportive but uh, hesitant to express their support explicitly, and therefore the supportive feeling might have uh, manifested as an increase in don't know. Um, and I wonder if this has also happened um, in the experimental context of studies. Yeah, that is really good point. Actually, we didn't allow people say do not know. So we didn't have do not know option because Sabe, I mean Japanese, tend to say do not know in any question, for any question, and also choose neutral position for any survey. So we really wanted to force them to choose either stand, support, or pause. So we intentionally uh, didn't provide the or do not know option. So, but someone really critical about that kind of survey design. 
and there should be some debate whether we should have do not know responses or not. But this one, we didn't uh, uh, put that option. Uh, I think there, there are several <laughs> questions I think <laughs> there. Thanks. Um, so to me, the current calculus is that uh, Kim would rather die than allow any of his neighbors to get more nukes. Um, so how much is this a question of how much do you want to die with the biggest weapon in your hand? Hmm. Um, this one really, I, I don't think people think in that far. I mean, this is just a, um, a bringing nuclear weapon. Maybe they are not really thinking to use it. But the first step for Japanese is to have nuclear weapon to store them for emergency. So they're really not thinking to like, use for die or something. So is that answer to your question? Yeah. All right, next from the floor. Thank you so much for sharing your very informative and important <laughs> research. Uh, I was kind of curious, building off of two things. One, your, your question about, uh, I guess, sharing or storing nuclear weapons in Japan versus Guam, as well as your inclusion of people in Hiroshima to kind of see if folks there have a particular opinion. And uh, please forgive my uh, lack of knowledge on this particular topic, but in terms of like public discussion of nuclear sharing in Japan, how concrete is that discussion? Like are there specific sites within Japan where if this happened, the nuclear weapons would be stored? And if so, I was curious to see like if folks in that area had certain opinions, like sort of like a not in my backyard ism, uh, yeah. perhaps. That's what I was curious about. Uh, so the current status of nuclear discussion, first of all, is getting lower. So when Mr. Abe claimed this policy, there's lots of huge news. And especially current Prime Minister Kishida, Fumio Kishida is elected from Hiroshima. So he really cannot say to support nuclear shelling option. But some really conservative member of LDP really supportive. And also newly created party Ishin, uh, revolutionary party in Japan, is really supportive for nuclear shelling op option. And they try to change traditional non-nuclear principle into two principle, so which means allow uh, introducing nuclear weapon. And therefore, uh, people, normal people, are really not talking about nuclear shelling uh, currently. So the debate is, is not fully blown. Uh, Reggie. Thank you so much for your interesting talk. Um, I was, I think I have a question that was related to, to this question about, um, I guess, methods or the kind of choice around methods. I was struck by, I mean, you, you talked about the lack of survey participation and the decision to use a, a mail survey as opposed to the, I think you called the end face or the in-person interviews. And so I was wondering if that was about cost or uh, kind of what the, the reasoning was around that and basically what your team's sense of um, what the pros or cons might be, particularly given the, the quote, sensitivity of this issue. Um, in terms of the, the, the method of the research or the, um, in, that, in that effect. And I was also then wondering a little bit about the, um, um, maybe the culture of training interviewers in this context around this kind of issue. Um, I, I guess if there's a special kind of, um, in realizing how sensitive this particular topic might be, if there's certain types of, um, awareness that was kind of trained around kind of how to ask certain questions or how to ask follow-ups or in that anticipating that say Japanese audiences might want to say I don't know if there's a way to kind of uh, what the, the nature of the the preparation was around kind of how to ask questions. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. So our method choice for your first point is for two reasons. The first is the cost. So this is online survey. It's really cheap for asking uh, 2,000 or 3,000 population. That's one reason. The other one is more theoretical reason, which is about socially desirability bias. So people often ask, for example, interview them. People may not think 
uh, may not reveal their true preference because socially uh, to kind of express support nuclear weapon is socially undesirable. So people uh, face interview kind of we cannot collect candid opinion from the population. That's why we chose um, 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 the mail survey or uh, online survey. And I think, I don't know, um, actually we really don't know what kind of people are answering our question because survey company really reveal their sample population. So, um, so maybe some people are really uh, kind of uh, used to answer this type of question. Uh, but I have no data on how general population kind of trained to answer um, this kind of survey question. Sorry, it's not, maybe not enough for your show. So, sorry, there is a there's one question uh, in the queue on Zoom for a while, so let me uh, let me introduce that question first. Uh, so, I think this is kind of the opposite direction of one of the previous questions, uh, which is, uh, what are the potential implications of the conclusions um, about the nuclear taboo for the current renewable energy debate to address climate change for Japan and elsewhere? Uh, so, I think what it means probably uh, my interpretation of this question is, you know, um, after Fukushima, Japan stopped all nuclear plants, but now they are trying to restart doing it. And the nuclear, what, what is the relationship between the nuclear taboo and, and that, uh, I guess, restart policy or something? Um, but well, um, to be honest, I'm not an expert of energy side. But my personal viewpoint is Japanese may be separate view uh, toward nuclear energy thing and also nuclear weapon thing. Because in Japan, there's a lot of nuclear um, power plant which generate uranium uh, things on which we can build nuclear weapon. But um, I don't think um, the nuclear energy policy thing um, kind of directly related to Japanese position for nuclear uh, weapon. So I don't think I'm answering this question with, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is another uh, from the floor. Uh, thank you very much for uh, such an interesting uh, presentation. So uh, my question is a very basic question about uh, the word nuclear taboo. So uh, even I am a Japanese citizen, so I, I'm not sure about uh, Japanese nuclear taboo. So uh, what does uh, nuclear taboo implies or means in your uh, research context? Thank you. Uh, that's really important point. So the concept of nuclear taboo. So yeah, it's true. We really don't know what it is, but in this um, study, we assume some kind of allergic reaction to talking about nuclear weapon or the kind of atmosphere which really not allow for Japanese people to express um, true opinion toward nuclear weapon. So this is you know, reluctance or hesitancy toward it. Uh, speaking up nuclear weapon. That is, we think, as taboo. But yeah, I think there's a debate what's really taboo. Uh, is there any other questions from the floor? If not, let me ask the final, probably the final question, which is, um, so you actually didn't talk about the relationship bit or, or the timing uh, uh, relating to the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think, you know, in Japan at least, the media coverage talks a lot about sort of the U.S. Hesitant, hesitancy to intervene or assist Ukraine because of uh, Russian nuclear weapons. And that is kind of an analogy uh, for kind of a Japanese security environment where, you know, if China um, make, an, make an attack against Taiwan or Japan, like, is, is the U.S. really going to intervene? And so, I guess, um, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, 
you know, the effect of the, that event or maybe the, the changing context of, the, uh, of the, um, the people's view on this kind of issues, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Um, that's really hard. I think the inv Russian invasion to Ukraine goes both direction among Japanese public opinion. The one election is actually um, Japanese people feel more like not to have nuclear weapon because President Putin kind of actually threat to use nuclear weapon. So there is kind of uh, event prompt Japanese going against nuclear weapon. But the other side, some people really feel to, uh, it's important to increase deterrence capability by having nuclear weapon or at least increasing capability of uh, defense capability. So Russian invasion cases go either direction. And I think theoretically we should examine the possibility that we cannot rely on U.S. alliance commitment or there would be possibility that the United States will not fulfill the commitment when things happen. Um, that should uh, be something we need to test in the future. But currently we haven't done that kind of experiment. Okay, um, there are no questions from the floor. Um, uh, please join me thanking Professor Matsumura again, and thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for coming to the talk. Attention. This is the end of the, today's noon lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.